Hi, I'm Kerry Gordon, co-chair of the Code for Live Planning Committee. On behalf of all of the committees and volunteers, greetings and welcome to Code for Live 2021. This is the first and hopefully the last fully online con. We hope that what we learn here will carry over when we meet again in person. Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment of silence to remember those we have lost in the last year. We have a record 600 attendees. Before I introduce Rudolf Kemper and we get started, a few notes and acknowledgements. Our official hashtag is C4L21. That's hashtag the letter C, the number four, the letter L, and the number 21. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out in the Code for Live Slack workspace. That workspace, along with Whova, are our primary channels of communication. We also have a presence in Twitter and Discord. The Code for Live supports Slack channel is the best place to go for Whova or Zoom help and conference-related questions. We also have the Code for Live social Slack channel for things social. One note about Whova. If you have the screen space and the real estate or more than one device, you will likely be better served by opening the Zoom webinars in rooms outside of Whova. Note that the chat and Q&A are disabled in Zoom, so please use those services in Whova. We have our whoops, we have our community support squad to assist attendees. You can reach them anytime at sorry, you can reach them anytime during the con by messaging at CSS and Slack. The community volunteer support volunteers for our first block today are Anne-Marie Mesco and Sean Averkamp. Thank you to CLRDLF and specifically to Sharon Ivy Weiss and Louise Quasigra for continuing to be our fiscal host. They were also instrumental in helping us get a paid Slack workspace. And a big thanks to Jennifer Cummings and Kathy Azevedo from Concentra. They are the engine that makes the con happen. I'd also like to thank Ryan Wick and Oregon State University. OSU has provided and Ryan has managed the Code for Live web infrastructure from time immemorial. From our social activities committee, there will be a lot of information thrown at you in a short period of time with Code for Live. You will be mentally exhausted before the conference ends, we guarantee it. If you need to take a break from the talks, the virtual quiet room on Whova has a variety of meditative and restorative activities to help you rest up for the next batch of talks. Talks are recorded so you can catch up on anything you might have missed at any time. The virtual quiet room is listed under the logistics menu in Hoover. Speaking of recording talks, uh, talks will be available through Hoover to registered attendees, that's you, uh, immediately and for the foreseeable future. Shortly after the conference ends, session blocks will be uploaded to our public YouTube channel. Starting tomorrow, there will be social, e social events each evening beginning at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. 
You can sign up for these events on Whova. For tonight, you can consider creating your own event for your fellow attendees. Just go to the DIY event stock posted in the virtual meets thread on the Whova community board to create or sign up for an attendee organized event. We would like to thank our sponsors for their support this year. Our platinum sponsors are OCLC and Blacklight, Silver, EBSCO, Inter Innovative Interfaces, and MIT Libraries, sponsoring closed captioning and post-conference video production. Bronze, performance software featuring fair copy, Princeton University and the Princeton University Developers for Diversity, our diversity sponsors, Disability, Mental Health and Accessibility in Libraries, Luracis, Balsamic, our closed caption, a closed captioning sponsor, and Index Data. At the contributor level, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign School of Information Sciences and Samvera. Somehow I think some very doesn't get equal time there. Uh, also, a thank you to the generous individuals in the Code for Live community for support of the Angel Fund and for making financial assistance possible, the, the financial assistance fund possible. This conference wouldn't be possible without the work of this year's planning committee. Peter Murray, my co-chair, Anne-Marie Mesco, Mike Taylor, Andrew Battellini, Blake Carver, Mary Jingelski. A little note about our keynote speaker. Bruno Kemper works with Digital Democracy on the program's team and leads the creation of the Earth Defenders Toolkit. Before joining Digital Democracy in 2020, Ruta worked for six years with the Amazon Conservation Team, where he focused on participatory mapping and intangible cultural heritage work with the indigenous and Afro-descendant communities in Suriname. Ruta currently serves on the executive boards of Native Land Digital and for the International Society for Participatory Mapping. He is one of the core stewards of the open source geostorytelling. Sorry, the open source geostorytelling application, Terra Stories. Please welcome Rio Camper. A little technical magic happening here while we switch it over. Hi, everyone. My name is Rito Kemper, and it's just such an honor and a pleasure to be with you today and to open this Code for Live conference and to have this wonderful opportunity to share with you a little bit about my work and about the pretty unexpected journey that led me to be involved in building open source software for communities to map their oral histories. Um, it's especially fun for me to be sharing this journey with Code for Lib, because as you'll see, this journey actually got started in the archives. So my talk is titled Open Source Tech Built with Local and Marginalized Communities for Mapping, Safeguarding, and Protecting Oral Histories. And I'd like to start off by telling you a little bit about myself. So I'm currently a program manager, geographer, and technology tinkerer working with digital democracy. I'm originally from the Netherlands in Curacao, which is an island in the Caribbean. And I'm currently residing in Springfield, Virginia, which is the traditional home of the Piscataway and Natchkochunk peoples. I've been a little bit all over the place with my background. Uh, I studied anthropology, international relations. I worked a little bit in web development and also archives. And one of my lifelong passions has been to find ways to use technology to help communities gain control over documenting their heritage and telling their own story. And it's actually my first time attending Code for Lib. 
and I'm super excited to get to know the community and to know more about your work over the next days. Oh, and you can follow me on Twitter at Rudo Kemper. Okay, so I told you that my journey started in the archives and there's me at age 23, already losing my hair <laughs> at my very first job at the Special Collections of the University of Miami Libraries, where I was a reading room attendant and research assistant. So I was really lucky to get this job right out of college uh, for one, because it landed, I landed it right in the middle of the financial crisis in 2008. And also because it was just this amazing and fun job where I got to, where I got paid to help people find materials for their incredibly interesting research projects and also hang out all day with these phenomenal old books and archival collections. So as a nerd, I really love this. <laughs> and fun fact, this is actually where I got my first hands-on library coding experience. So I don't know if anyone recognizes this application or to be honest with you, if it's still in use, uh, but this is the Aeon software for processing special collections requests. And the University of Miami was one of the first to pilot this software. And as a reading room attendant, I ended up spending quite a lot of my time filing bug reports for Aeon. I didn't know at the time that I was basically QA testing Aeon for free, but it got me really interested in learning how software works. Uh, more importantly, <laughs> while working at the U Miami archives, um, I became really interested in questions of marginalization and visibility. And I spent a lot of my time thinking about whose heritage and whose stories tend to be deposited in an archive and whose is not. And that thinking is what got me involved um, in a project to document the oral history of a shanty town for the homeless in Miami called Emoja Village. So Emoja was founded on a plot of unused land by Take Back the Land. And it was home to over a hundred residents who shared the space and built a thriving community there, even with a small library. And it stood for over a year until one day it was mysteriously burnt down and it went back to being an unused plot of land. So I was really stricken by the fact that Emoja was literally wiped off the map, like it never existed. And working at the archives, I wanted to find a way for the story of Emoja to be found there. So with the help of Take Back the Land, we located a number of the former residents and we recorded oral histories about their lives and what it was like to live at Emoja. And what we did was we placed those oral histories in an official collection at the archives so that they could forever be heard by anyone interested. This was just a short project while I worked at the archives. Um, but when I thought about preparing for this presentation, I realized it's really where my interest in enabling marginalized communities to document their own stories was born and that it really influenced the rest of my career um, including what I'm about to focus on in the remainder of this presentation. The other really formative experience at the archives for me was learning about the history of the Maroons in the Caribbean. So Maroons are descendants of Africans who escaped from slavery and formed settlements in the interior. Uh, the University of Miami had a really sizable collection of holdings about the Caribbean, and I was exposed to a number of old books about, about Maroon communities in places like Suriname which like Curacao was part of the Dutch Caribbean. In Suriname, the Maroons fled into the rainforest uh, where they were chased down by the colonial Dutch army, as you can see in the pictograph here, but eventually they overpowered the Dutch and successfully forced them to sign peace treaties, give, giving them the right to exist in the rainforest, which was taking place in the late 1700s. And they still reside there today. So in Suriname, there are six distinct Maroon groups, each with a very strong traditional culture and speaking Creolized languages that are a mixture of European and African languages. The Maroons are known to have a really unique oral history storytelling tradition that narrates when their ancestors first fled from the plantations and settled along the river banks of their lands. And this very much shapes their collective identity and their worldview today. Um, but the Maroons in Suriname also face marginalization in society and kind of like with Emoja village, their histories are not found on the maps. So when you go on Google or a different kind of platform and you zoom in on Maroon lands, you find mountain ranges and rapids which have Dutch colonial names instead of the names that the Maroons give them referring to their proud leaders and their ancestors. So I was really inspired by learning about the Maroons and the history of Suriname. And so a few years after working in the archives, I made the trip over from Curacao to Suriname. And if you don't know where these places are, here is a hopefully helpful map. <laughs> So Suriname is part of the three Guyanas countries in South America, which are located east of Venezuela and north of Brazil. And there's really a lot to say about Suriname and how it's a really fascinating and unique place in the world. Um, but what I'll say here is that uh, the majority of the country is covered by pristine, undisturbed rainforest. It's part of the Amazon you know, basin, not basin, but ecosystem. 
and it's home to both indigenous people and Maroon communities. So after a few years of toiling around in Suriname and briefly uh, trying to do a PhD in anthropology and quickly realizing it wasn't for me and that I didn't want to be an academic, I found a way to work here in 2014. So I discovered this um, community-based conservation organization called the Amazon Conservation Team. And they were looking for somebody to help coordinate a participatory mapping project with one of the Maroon groups, which are called the Matawai. So for me, I've always loved maps and I ended up picking up a few GIS skills during the PhD. So I was incredibly excited uh, to join this team and to partake in this project. Why did the Matawai want to make maps? Um, there were basically two reasons. So one, there's a number of threats emerging in the Matawai lands, such as uh, hydraulic or small scale gold mining, which you can see in the imagery here. And this is really a particularly destructive form of mining that involves cutting down the forest, uh, sucking up water from the rivers or creeks to blast the soil, and then using mercury to extract the gold from the rest of the mud. So there's a huge risk of mercury contamination uh, spreading into the waterways and into the environment. And there's a tremendous amount of gold mining taking place in Matawai lands. And they wanted maps to see where that gold mining is taking place relative to their villages and their resources. The second reason is that the Matawai as this Maroon community that has resided here, you know, for hundreds of years, over 300 years, they have a great amount of knowledge about their lands and there are thousands of local place names that don't show up on the public maps. So they wanted to map their place-based knowledge and overlay that with the threats in the territory to see how they line up. And that's where ACT as an organization with mapping experience came in to help train the Matawai to make their own maps. So we started a participatory mapping project with the Matawai, uh, focused on their spatial knowledge of the lands, and really started off with sketch mapping in the villages, as you can see here, where people draw and they write down what they know on big sheets of paper, which really just only have the river showing. And in doing this, we had the involvement of the elders, as well as the young people. And we had both groups of men and women making their own maps separately to, re to really to ensure that everyone's knowledge is captured. These workshops took place during my first days working with the Matawai, and although I didn't know the language yet, it was really amazing to see people navigating the rivers in their minds and the amount of storytelling that just spontaneously emerges out of this mapping exercise, you know, with the kids sitting around the table listening and engaged, and it was just really something special to see. So following the workshops in the villages, um, our team of ACT field staff, as well as young Matawai boatsmen, went on a few week-long expeditions with elders who were kind of identified as the strongest knowledge keepers. And this was really where we also got to see the importance of documenting the community's oral knowledge in action. So the Matawai boatsmen, they had of course navigated the rivers before a number of times, and they knew of some of the place names, especially as it had to do with navigating the river, such as the rapids, um, but really nothing to the extent that the elders had with them. And for them, the entire expedition was this incredible experience of journeying through the history of their lands with countless lively and rich stories being shared throughout the, the trip, you know, on the boat at night over the campfire, and some of which going back hundreds of years to the first times that their Matawai ancestors first arrived here. After the expeditions, several other experiences took place that really made an impact on our team. So the first was sitting down uh, with Mama Dora Flink, who's on the left here, to do a validation on our draft maps. So after the expeditions, we had compiled draft maps and we wanted to bring those back to the communities and really to get feedback from everybody to see uh, whether they were complete, if we were missing anything. And so the Matawai mappers wanted to sit down with Mama Dora because she is just this incredibly lively and engaging storyteller who loves talking about Matawai history. So the team thought, let's sit down with Mama Dora to see what she thinks. And we were going through this list of different place names just to see if she knew where they were located because we hadn't mapped them during the expeditions. And one place name in particular was named, which is the site of an old village. Um, and suddenly her eyes lit up. And Mama Dora, she just started to share this really beautiful long story about a female Matawai ancestor who carried rice in her hair when she escaped the plantation. And you know the, the refugees, they then fled as far as they could along the river and ended up very far upstream where they finally settled this very first village and decided to permanently stay there. And at that moment, she planted that rice and that's still the rice that the community eats today. 
And it was just this incredible story for everybody to hear. You know, she broke into song. She used the banana leaf nearby kind of to illustrate a boat on the river. And it was just this, everybody was spellbound listening to this amazing story that is really so central to the history of the Matawai as a people, right? Um, another story is while this mapping was taking place, we obtained all the available books we could find on Matawai history and culture, of which there were literally only two. And both are academic dissertations written in English. So this one on the right um, had some photos. So I thought it would be nice to uh, bring along and show it to people. And you can see some of the pictures in the book here. It's a, sort of a classic anthropology dissertation where there's a few pictures that are featured that were taken by the anthropologists. And I thought it would be nice to bring it along and show it to people to see if they recognize anybody and to give a picture of life as it was 40 years ago. And doing so ended up being a really powerful experience for people as they recognize their relatives and just people from their childhood, uh, many of whom are no longer present. And I have this very vivid memory of one man in particular who saw the book and he recognized the photo of his grandmother and he got emotional and even upset with us. And he asked, why do you have a photo of my grandmother and I don't? And I really, I still think about that question all the time. So in 2017, after a few years of data collection, you know, the maps were made um, and the community was glad to have this resource as a reference for knowing what's going on in the territory relative to different Matawai landmarks and place names. Um, but the mapping really brought about this heightened awareness, right? Uh, in the community of the need to take action and to safeguard invaluable Matawai oral histories about their lands. And that these are really what brings the places on the map to life and makes them meaningful to the community. So in partnership with one of the local Matawai organizations, ACT started to focus on helping the community record their elders sharing oral histories. So for one year, our team worked with the younger people uh, that were interested to learn how to use the recording equipment and we established a process on conducting an oral histories interview with the elders. A lot of the uh, younger Matawai that were really drawn to the project were people that when they were young, they moved to the city, um, grew up there and didn't really get the chance to hear any of the stories. The elders, they were initially kind of cautious and apprehensive about wanting to share, but they became inspired by these young people that were very motivated and you know, eager really to continue the tradition of storytelling and to ensure that there's a record of that knowledge which can survive for the future generations. And by the end of the year, uh, we managed to accumulate quite some content with I think over 300 oral histories recorded, um, 35 elders interviewed and over 17 hours of footage. And when we took inventory of all this, it was just really inspiring to consider like how a mapping project morphed into the creation of this incredible repository of memories and stories. You know, it started as just recording locations of names and places became this uh, really awe-inspiring community-led initiative of historical preservation and education. And for us, this really highlighted the power of technology when you put it in the hands of a marginalized community that historically has not had the means to write down their own stories or to create their own archives. Just like with Emoja Village, you know, the simple act of recording and placing in an archive is a simple but really powerful way to ensure that a community story does not get lost in time. But on the theme of technology, we were also left with the challenge, right? So since so many of the oral histories were about places in the Matawai lands, we wanted to find a, a digital way to connect the maps and the stories, the recordings of the stories directly. And, you know, we were really inspired by all of these kind of emerging resources for digital storytelling with maps, such as Esri story maps or Google Earth creation tools. But with those, we ran into one critical limitation. They all depend on the internet. And the Matawai, being a rainforest people, don't have internet access. And the other thing is that a lot of these resources are really more for telling stories using maps rather than maintaining an archive of map stories with a lot of considerations about access and restrictions and protecting the data. So we started to sketch out a little bit more of what we might want out of a digital tool for maintaining an archive of map stories and also talking to other communities across the globe. And, you know, ACT um, as a community-based conservation organization also works with indigenous peoples in the Amazon. So we had a sense of their needs as well. And just at conferences, speaking to folks from 
Siberia, from Canada, we landed on these considerations. So first of all, we wanted an interactive map with stories. Um, in terms of offline, first design, we wanted the tools to be able to work entirely offline so that any remote communities like the ones that I mentioned can access all parts of the tool. Um, thinking about decolonial local maps. So we wanted the tool to be able to visualize and directly link the oral histories, uh, the recordings of oral histories to custom maps that show the lands from the community's perspective. Uh, there's a concern of data sovereignty and local access. So since the tool would contain an archive of stories and knowledge that may sometimes be sensitive or really just more intended for internal usage, uh, the tool should be able to give the community full control over who has access to the data and who does not. Uh, free and open source, so it can be used by anybody across the world and adapted as needed. The sixth point was really kind of our North Star, right? This uh, notion of when an elder dies, a library is burnt down, which is a really powerful saying which is attributed to this Malian ethnologist, Amadou Hampate Ba. And it's really a saying that felt particularly true for communities with a strong oral culture like the Matawai. And lastly, fun to play with. You know, we wanted it to be this cool application that the young people who are, you know, used to walking around with cell phones and are exposed to kind of more modern technologies would really enjoy interacting with it and learning about their culture in a fun and exciting way. And since we couldn't find an app that could meet all those needs, um, I thought back to some of my previous work in web development, messing around with content management systems like WordPress and Drupal and uh, getting them to work on a local computer with a WAMP stack or a LAMP stack. And so with a healthy dose of naivete, I thought, why don't we just make our own map? <laughs> we didn't have any resources or funding, but that's okay. We can figure it out, piece of cake, right? Yeah, that didn't really go so well. <laughs> um, I spent about a year wrestling with Drupal and uh, custom content types and trying to get it to load offline maps. I played around also with this application that some of you probably know called Mukurtu, which is also based on Drupal, uh, but didn't really have the mapping piece figured out at the time anyway. And it turned out to be this really massive undertaking. And we even got ACT to shelve out a little bit of funding to hire a few consultants. And they pretty much all bowed out one after the other after realizing just what's involved in creating an application like this. Um, but luckily in 2018, I was introduced to this really wonderful community and collective of open source developers called Ruby for Good, who you guessed it, work on projects designed with Ruby and Ruby on Rails uh, that have a good purpose. And what they do is they organize these weekend log hackathons. And I pitched them the idea of this application and how it would really benefit this amazing community in Suriname. And they loved it and accepted the pitch. And so with that, Terra Stories was born. And this was the very first group of developers and designers who worked on Terra Stories over one weekend in the summer of 2018. And some of the folks here have continued to work on Terra Stories long after that one and even gone on to be core stewards of the application. So I don't know if anyone has ever been to an in-person hackathon, but it's basically a lot of sitting around looking at computer screens, uh, either separately or in pairs or as a group, uh, drinking lots of coffee, and then playing board games at night. And it's a lot of fun. And for me, it was just really inspiring to see this concept, you know, this idea that we had in the field of terror stories, uh, literally materializing before our eyes, just by the phenomenal work of this amazing team. And this is the prototype of Terra Stories that was, again, literally developed over the course of just one weekend. We had a fully functional interactive map. We had a card with stories about places on the map and then accompanying videos. And when you click on one of the places, it filters the story. So only those which are about that place. And this was all working offline. It was just really something amazing that I almost couldn't believe. So in the months after the Ruby for Good Hackathon, a large part of the team continued to work on Terra Stories and making sure that we had um, an MVP, you know, a minimum viable product to be able to bring back to the Matawai later in the year. So we worked on a pretty much daily basis in a volunteer team to add language support, um, improving the user interface, hunting down bugs, and just improving the overall functionality of the application, as you can see here. Uh, during this time, I also became more familiar with the code base. And so I started to feel more comfortable slowly but surely making my own contributions so this is my very first pull request where I pretty much just added a basic HTML link to get back to the welcome screen of Terra Stories, just a baby step there. <laughs> but later I got to be more involved in doing some of the coding as well and reviewing uh, pull requests that other people have made. 
And then in October 2018, it was time to finally bring back terror stories uh, back to the Matawai in Suriname. So for the occasion, uh, my friend Kali Marmaya, who is one of the Terror Stories core stewards and developers, he was able to come along, which was sponsored by the company Mapbox that he was working for at the time. And for him, it was just this amazing experience where, you know, he got to travel to this remote part of Suriname that he'd been looking at on the screen for all these months. And I remember this one time uh, that we were getting uh, ready to do a presentation at the public school, and we discovered that we had some final debugging to do. So we had to actually wait for the village generator to start up. There's no power during the day. And then somebody around eight o'clock starts the village generator, and then it only runs for a couple of hours at night to provide electricity, really mainly so that people can run their freezers and for people to be able to store the food that they hunt and maintain it for a longer period of time. And then it shuts off at around 10 p.m. or so, so it runs for a couple of hours. So we realized that there's an issue still with Terra Stories and we're presenting the next day. So we're thinking, oh my God, we have to fix this and we have to debug this. And we didn't have a monitor. So we had to hook up the projector and display it on the wall. And we were literally working against the clock because the generator could be turned off at any minute. And it was this kind of stressful, <laughs> anxiety-inducing experience for Kalimar and myself to be able to quickly make the changes in the code so we can have something awesome to show tomorrow without this like breaking uh, bug that we encountered. Um, but we got it done. And the next day, we were able to give a presentation for the school kids um, at the public school in uh, Pusukunu, one of the villages in Matawai. And this was really the first time that anybody from the community got to see all the work that we put into Build Terror Stories. So it was this really exciting moment to see how you know the kids and everybody that was present would react to it. And it was just amazing to see how the kids gravitated towards the application and were really drawn into the stories, you know, for them to learn about the places that are a part of their daily life. Like there's this uh, granite rock in the river behind the school where they jump off to go swimming after class, which to them is kind of an ordinary place that they didn't really know about. And then for them to be able to hear one of the elders telling a story about that granite rock and how hundreds of years ago people used to, before they would arrive in Matawai territory, if you're an outsider or visitor, you would have to, with your boat, navigate around that granite rock three times before you're allowed to land at the specific place to first ask permission of the chieftain to be able to enter into the community, which is something that no longer happens today, right? Um, and so they heard the story of that and they were just spellbound listening to that. And one of the teachers asked one of the kids to re-narrate the story afterward and he was able to produce it pretty much word for word. And so you have this ordinary place as part of their daily life that's just transformed you know, into this almost magical history. And the awesome thing is they got to do it through the words of the elders as it's always been done through oral storytelling, right? And so for us, that was just really inspiring to see. And the teachers at the public school are also really excited about terror stories because for them, you know, they're working kind of a resource scarce environment. They don't have a lot of materials to engage with the kids and especially that speaks to their kind of life world. And so for them, it's this incredibly powerful resource where the kids can learn a whole bunch of things at the same time. You know, you've got computer skills, you've got geography, you've got history, uh, you've got language, and it's kind of all packaged via a tool that is literally designed and tailored for their community. So with that, ACT, as a kind of a conclusion to this project, um, decided to set up a few mini computers with Terra Stories and deposited them specifically at the media libraries at the public schools so that the teachers can have full control over accessing it and kind of using it as part of the curriculum with the students. So since that time, since that time in October 2018, uh, we've been really lucky to have grown as an open source community. And we've had numerous contributions to Stare Stories from over 60 individuals. And this is only just a small subset of the different people that have contributed. And a big part of that success has been due to having a thriving community on Slack and also having a few dedicated stewards who regularly groom our issues and make sure that they're well scoped out and easy to work on for open source developers. Also, Terra Stories has been adopted by other communities. So this is the welcome screen for Terra Stories for the Wauja indigenous people in Brazil who are using it to map stories about sacred lagoons and caves. And as we start to work with new communities, uh, we are taking their specific needs into account when adapting our roadmap. Uh, this is part of our principles of co-design and co-creation with communities. So involving communities as much as possible in the process of designing the software rather than pre-designing it somewhere else and then delivering it. And this is Terra Stories being used by another indigenous community, which are the Haudenosaunee people from Six Nations Reserve, 
which are located nearby the Niagara Falls in Canada. So the Haudenosaunee are mapping traditional ecological knowledge and stories of the Grand River, and they hope to overlay that with scientific data about water quality to show how water contamination from upstream is affecting their important cultural places along the river. So now I'd like to give you a very quick tour of how Terra Stories works. Uh, this is using a demo that was actually set up for the Indigenous Mapping Workshop, which was online this past November. And you can actually access this demo yourself um, at terrastories.io if you'd like to check it out and explore. Okay, so this is the welcome screen of Terra Stories, where you can log in or change the language. Terra Stories supports internationalization or localization and can be translated into any language you want. So for this Terra Stories build for Indigenous Mapping Workshop, which was supposed to take place in Saskatchewan, this actually says welcome or hello in the Cree native language. And then at the bottom here, you can change it to English or Japanese or really any language that you want to add. With that said, let's click on enter site and check out the main app interface. Terra Stories is composed of an interactive map and a sidebar with storytelling content. For this demo of Terra Stories, we opted to put in a basic satellite map and some indigenous lands data overlapping with the Saskatchewan province, courtesy of the website Native Lands. And to honor the indigenous communities who were here before the colonial lines were drawn in the sand, and of course still are here, we turned off the country borders. So the way that this works is that when you click on any of the points on the map, it filters the sidebar, the only stories about that place. And then you can also click on a story to navigate to the associated places. So there's a dual interactivity there. Important to note is that these are all made up stories about indigenous mapping workshop that are here just for demonstration purposes without any video or audio content. And of course, the best way to experience terror stories in its full glory is with a real community's maps and stories. But the idea here is just to review the core functionality of the app. In addition, there are also these filters at the top left of the sidebar, which you can use to filter the stories in the sidebar in the map. So you can filter by region, by type of place, or by speaker. So let's pick type of place, which is set to work with the community taxonomies for places, and pick hotel. And it will do two things. One, it filters the places on the map to only show places marked as hotel, and it zooms in to the maximum extent of those places. And two, it filters the sidebar to only stories about a hotel. Now, if we go back to the welcome screen, let's actually log in with a credential. And when we do that, what we see now is that there are restricted stories showing up. So you've got this story here on the left about the indigenous mapping workshop in Australia, which we can now press or click on and navigate to. And notice that it also has a little lock there on the sidebar to show you that it's a restricted story. And now if we select speaker, IMW Australia shows up, which wouldn't have if you weren't logged in because all their stories are set as restricted. This is how we protect the knowledge and stories within Terra Stories and ensure that the communities have the ability to restrict and control the access per each individual story. This is only a quick overview of how Terra Stories works on the front end and there is, of course, much more to how it works in terms of being able to add and edit content and control who has access. And if you're interested in exploring more about that, we do have some hands-on and self-guided tutorial materials available on the website at terrastories.io. Uh, something else which is very exciting that we just recently added in the past months is we now have an online server set up at r.terrastories.io where we can create a community for anybody who is interested to work with Terra Stories and just get started creating maps and stories without having to set up your own server. And if you're interested in trying out Terra Stories, just let me know on Slack or via email if you're interested and we'll get that up and running for you. So for anyone who's interested in taking a peek under the hood and seeing how Terra Stories is built, I will briefly show this uh, diagram of the architecture. Um, so Terra Stories is a progressive web app it works both offline and online. So depending on the deployment, you've got either a local tile server, which is powering the map, or you can use an online map from Mapbox. And then Terra Stories is basically a media content management system, which is built on top of those maps, uh, powered by Ruby on Rails, uh, React, and it works with a Postgres database. In terms of deployment for online, we use Heroku and AWS. And for offline, 
we've got this workflow set up where you've got this mini computer. Um, when you turn it on, it generates a Wi-Fi hotspot. And then any device which connects to that Wi-Fi will be able to access Terra Stories when you go to when you navigate to terrastories.io in the browser. So what's coming up next? Uh, we have a lot of exciting features in the works. So we are in the process of right now finishing this uh, thing that we're calling a curriculum builder, where you can create presets of stories and have them play in a particular order. This is one of the requests of the teachers at Matawai because uh, the Terra stories for Matawai has over actually over 300 stories. And so they wanted to find a way to be able to pre-select some of those stories and to cover those during the day, right? During the lecture. Um, so that's something that we're working on. Uh, more custom theming options for communities so that people can add their own logos and uh, their own colors, their own color scheme. Um, custom orientation for the map in addition to north south. So different communities across the world have different ways of viewing the map and the globe. And depending on where they are and what their landscape looks like, south, the world might be upside down. So the Matawai, you know, to go um, up literally in their language means to go south because you're going upstream. So to them, the world is upside down. <laughs> um, coach marks to be able to help orient the user when they first load it. So arrows pointing to the different ways that you can interact with Terra stories. Uh, we're working on a scene queue for stories that have been played. So you have a reference to what you've already checked out and what's still left to, to listen to. And also another user request from indigenous peoples in Colombia that are working on uh, restoring and reclaiming their language audio for place name pronunciation. So when you open up a place, there's a button that pronounces, that to play an audio file that pronounces the name of the place. And this is what we're dreaming of. So big picture ideas on our roadmap. So complete redesign of the administrative backend to make it more user-friendly. Uh, we're thinking a lot about sharing between different communities that are using Terra Stories. So if one community wants to share a story with another, how would they go about doing that? Uh, multiple maps geo and multiple geospatial layers and being able to toggle between those or showing a specific map for a, a specific story. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer syncing between devices. So if you have different builds of Terra Stories scattered across a community and somebody adds a story in one device, how do you then get it to the other device, right? This is something that we're thinking a lot about right now in terms of how to accomplish that. Um, another big dream of ours is this thing that we're calling um, Elder in Your Pocket, which is mobile notifications about a story when you are nearby a place. So let's say you're out navigating the river and you are within 100 meters or even a kilometer, let's say, close to an important site, you get a notification in your on your phone that says, hey, you're nearby the sacred site, would you like to hear a story about it? And lastly, more contributors. You know, help us shape Terra Stories. We really welcome for anyone to get involved and shape the direction of Terra Stories. And we would love for this tool to be more adopted by libraries and archives. And it would be amazing to have input from the community on that. Uh, something else exciting on the horizon is a new project that I'm currently stewarding with Digital Democracy called Earth Defenders Toolkit, um, which is going to be a collection of open source tools and training materials for frontline communities with a mission to increase autonomy and reduce dependency as much as possible for communities to use those tools. So if you take a tool like Terra Stories, which is part of the toolkit, um, how can we make it so user-friendly to install and use that the accompaniment of somebody like us to help with onboarding is no longer necessary? It's an ambitious project and we're hoping to launch a first iteration later this year. And if you'd like to stay up to date, you can sign up at earthdefenderstoolkit.com and we're also looking to learn about other tools out there that could be useful for Earth Defender communities. So if you'd like to get involved or help co-create this, uh, please, anyone is welcome to contribute here as well. So to close, I would actually like to bring things back to the Matawai community and actually return to the archives as well. So last year, ACT published an extensive multi-chapter online story map about Matawai oral history and cultural heritage which is, you know, it really heavily draws on some of the oral histories work that we captured using Terra Stories. And we also added some archival research, as well as a few written contributions by folks from UNESCO and from the Surinamese National Archive. And you can find this link on the ACT's website at amazonteam.org. So in the story map, what we try to do is use archival materials and interactive maps to tell the story of how the Matawai fled from the plantations and what the landscape looks like today. So here's an example of a swipe map where you can kind of look at one of the oldest plantation maps of Suriname 
and then the contemporary landscape using imagery and kind of see how it's changed, you know, in the span of 300 years. And the other really interesting thing is, of course, um, with the permission of the Matawai community, we draw on the oral histories archive to map the journey of how their ancestors settled in what is now their territory along the Saramaka River using historical photos and then also quotes from selected oral histories. So when you go to the, the story map, what you can do is you can literally see how the Matawai started at the plantations and what their journey looked like as they traveled upstream, um, arriving along the Saramaka River, which is where they reside today. And then in the sidebar, we have um, quotes from the oral histories that really kind of bring this journey to life along with photos um, and a description of the different places where they settled. And then we also have a chapter which is really dedicated to telling the story of how three Matawai researchers were able to travel to the archives, which was this really special uh, kind of experience uh, that took place at Smithsonian Institute's National Anthropology Archives. So they have this program called Recovering Voices, which is designed for community members to be able to visit the archives of anthropologists or sociologists or researchers that a, a long time ago did research in their community and for the community members to be able to repatriate those materials. So when I saw that, um, I was really inspired by that experience that I told you about with the dissertation book. And we similarly really wanted the Matawai to be able to repatriate their own materials from this archive and ensure that everyone in the community has access. And to me, this was also a very special moment because it was kind of a coming full circle in my own journey. If you remember me at 23, at the University of Miami Archives, then getting started working with Emoja, traveling to Suriname with the Maroons, and now coming back again, right, to the archives at Smithsonian. So on the story map, uh, there's this chapter with really just the voices of the Matawai sharing what it was like to be at the archive and, you know, really experiencing all these invaluable materials that were captured by this anthropologist Edward Green over 40 years ago. And I really recommend uh, reading this chapter for anyone who's interested in archives and community research. It's a literal transcript of um, a recording that we did where the Matawai were sort of discussing what it was like for them to be here for a week and what they felt and what they experienced. And I wanted to share with you this one quote uh, from Tina Henke, who's on the left here, which I think really just encapsulates the whole experience for them at the archives. So she said, um, these anthropologists wrote things down while my people back then couldn't write, but they told stories and then the anthropologists recorded them. And now that the people aren't with us anymore, we should be able to find a story somewhere. And that is what we're doing now here at this archive. I try to imagine how my ancestors lived back then. And that gives me a feeling of pride to be a Matawai because it helps me to know my roots. And again, I just think it does this awesome job of really capturing the whole experience and also really the mission behind Terra Stories you know, why are we doing this and why it's so important uh, for local communities to be able to document their own stories and their heritage. Okay, so to close, um, I want to give a heartfelt recognition to my Matawai friends who I have not been able to see for a year and a half because of the pandemic. Uh, they are some of the most amazing and inspiring people in the world and their vision is what led to all this. So I want to say gantangi fuunu or thank you uh, to the Matawai. And that's it. So thanks everyone so much for listening and I'm really excited to answer any questions and also to learn about what you think. Thanks everyone. Any uh, questions uh, that haven't been asked in uh, Hoova, you can ask them right here now. Hi everyone. So um, I thought I'd just mention a few things uh, that I saw coming up. Um, I definitely realized that in preparing this presentation that I should have added some links uh, for some of the resources as well as spelling out the names of places. Um, so I'm happy to add those in Whova for anybody that's interested in learning more about any of the content, anything that was mentioned. Um, there were a few other really interesting questions around internationalization, right, and the language aspect of terror stories. And, you know, the ones that you saw where there was Japanese and Matawai. So that's all in a text file. So anybody can contribute their own translations for um, any community contents. And that can be really helpful even for in the cases where there is a Western language, but it needs to be tailored to the specific uh, vernacular of the community. So that's all user generated. 
Um, there was an interesting question around adding stories, right? And so part of the goal of this project is for it to kind of promote this continued transmission of knowledge and for it to continue to be a lively tradition, which is what storytelling is, and to kind of avoid having this phenomenon where you have like one true story of a place, right? And that just becomes a reference point as though it has more authority than other people's stories that were not recorded. Um, so there's a whole methodology that we wrote out about how to ensure to continue to keep the project going um, long after a cycle, right? When the NGO is done working or the community is done working on a specific project that it continues to, to thrive. Um, there were some questions around supporting Terra Stories, which is great. So it's a volunteer, you know, open source project. So there's a lot of information on the website, terrastories.io, which I realize may have crashed <laughs> during this presentation. So I think we need to work on our, um, on our web hosting uh, infrastructure there. That's a realization that I'm having out of this presentation. Um, but you can sponsor us on GitHub if you're interested. And also there's a lot of issues on there if anybody wants to take a look at that. And as I mentioned in the talk, we'd really love to talk to anybody that's interested in seeing how this can work in a library and archive space or things that might be blind spots for us because we haven't thought about that specifically. Um, so that would be wonderful. And impacts on the Matawai community. There was a question around that, which is, I think, a really good one. Um, I talked a little bit about that towards the end. So, you know, with the Matawai, this kind of spurred this realization around cultural heritage as a whole. So there's also now an initiative to look at um, material, tangible artifacts. Like there's a lot of wood carvings that the community has done and painting that have just been sitting around because people haven't been thinking around heritage as much. So it's kind of stimulated um, a broader awareness around heritage more broadly as well as um, wanting to share some of the stories, which is what we did in the story map. You know, the Matawai, especially the younger people do want uh, the, the community in Suriname, as well as internationally to know they exist and what their story is. And are very proud of that. And so just that heightened awareness to wanting to share has come out of this as well. Uh, those are the ones that I logged. There might be some more that have come in. Um, I don't know, Carrie, if you saw any that I can address now and how, or how much time we have as well. Uh, we have we have six minutes. But, uh, I'm looking. Uh, so I see an interesting one. How did one. you get that data from the mini PC into your endpoint? Did you hit that? Um, I'm not sure I understand about the endpoint, but I think it's broadly like how do we work with offline and online, right? And how does data get? transferred from those conditions, I think is how I understand that question. Uh, just, and it's a really good one, actually. And there's a lot of even considerations around syncing between devices that we're now starting to think about. You know, if somebody in an offline condition in the Amazon is adding stories, there's first of all a concern around preservation, right? Devices break and um, need to be troubleshooted. And how do we ensure that we have a, a backup of that at all times, which is something we think a lot about and are trying to think through right now in terms of DevOps. Um, and we're, so we're looking at peer to peer a lot. I think I mentioned that in the talk as a type of infrastructure that actually digital democracy who I'm working with now has done a lot of work uh, developing into their mapping software, which is called Mapeo. So that's more for data collection. Terra stories is more for the visualization, right? Of stories. So Mapeo is built with peer to peer infrastructure. So we're looking at that as a way to get things from one device to another. Um, and in our case, in terms of like what we're sharing now, uh, the NGOs have constant contact with the communities and are able to then work with them to ensure also um, consent right around sharing. So everything that's been shared, you know, it has been proofed with consent with the community to ensure that the community wants to share it. So there's just a, a contact in terms of people being able to travel to the communities and having those kind of workshops where people give permission and then also some of that data gets transmitted during those sessions. Um, there was a really interesting question that I see around would this work for a more urban area um, to preserve those stories? And I think, you know, we worked with the communities in the rainforest, but I think all the time around like subcultures in a city and how cool it would be to have a terror stories of a particular subculture. Like um, I used to be into like punk music in New York City and DC, for example. And I think it would be really cool to like preserve stories around music or other kinds of subcultures in an urban area where you might not even need a map or a unique map, right? It could be that open street map is good enough. And then it would be relatively easy to start plugging away kind of oral histories um, of different places in an urban setting. I think that would be a very exciting application. Um, just, just monitoring it, to see if there's anything else. Sorry. Is there is there new data that is 
produced, collected that the Mattawai have been able to use or leverage in new ways? That's a vague question. Amy knows that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So there was some hesitation while we were actively working during the project from some storytellers that were identified as like, oh, you should definitely talk to uh, this woman or this man, right? Um, and when we when the community team approached them, they were kind of hesitant because they weren't sure about the nature of the project or like there was no compensation provided either. So they weren't just willing to dedicate their time in that way. But then once Terra Stories was produced and once we did manage to show that to the community and have these kinds of interactive sessions where the community was able to see, oh, okay, this is what this is producing. There was more interest than at that point in sharing. So after the project duration was over, a few folks have been contributing stories and the equipment, you know, was left behind with the community organization that really led this work. And so they've still been active uh, recording stories. And actually something really exciting that I didn't talk about is uh, there's a neighboring community called the Samaka who are more well known in terms of like maroon history and anthropology. And they also have a similar tradition and actually there's some kind of overlap in their histories where parts of the Samaka community were once with the Matawai and eventually migrated over one river over. And so there's now this really interesting discussion of the Matawai and the Samaka working together to sort of document their shared heritage, which is really exciting. Um, we haven't been able to make any progress on that because of the pandemic. Um, but there's um, a community-based organization from the Samaka side that's really interested in learning from the Matawai, which has done a really interesting kind of collaboration between two communities as well. So can you talk about best practices for working with these communities in the minute and a half you have remaining? <laughs> I could speak for an hour about that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's, it's a very, it's something we think about a lot, actually, especially with this Earth Defenders Toolkit project. And so there's a lot that I could say about it, but I think what comes to mind most, first and foremost, is just listening before acting, right? A lot of people, and especially organizations that, you know, get funding from donors internationally, come up with a project in advance and then present it to a community and say, do you want to do this? Um, or like are just generally pre-designed, and this is also applies to software, right? Like software is designed without thinking or getting input from communities and then sort of shown at, at a later phase where there's no more time or money to make any changes. And I think just listening before acting, right, is such an important thing. Um, and the other thing I would say is spending time and just dwelling a lot with the community and ensuring that they get to know you, uh, that there's a relationship of trust and reciprocity that's established, um, that they know you're in it for the long haul, that it's not just one of those initiatives where somebody shows up and introduces a project and does it and leaves and never comes back. Um, which often happens in academia as well, right? People do research and it's only for a short period of time and they write a dissertation and build a career off of that and then never bring any of the data back or the pictures, uh, like with the story that I mentioned, right? So I think, yeah, the long-term engagement and uh, first listening is what I would highlight in the time that we have. Okay, well, Rudo, thank you so much. And uh, please, if you will, imagine the sound of 600 of us standing and clapping wildly, which we would be doing if we were actually in person. I, we really appreciate this. Wonderful. Thanks so much, everyone. I really, really appreciate your time. And I'm, like I said, I'm really happy to continue the conversation and to share links and, you know, keep the conversation going. So thanks, everyone. It's well, wonderful. You can find us on Slack. You're in there. Uh, one thing I, I would like to say uh, to everyone about Slack is that please, uh, for chat, if you have chat that's related to the session, please do it in Whova because that way it's memorialized along with the session and we can find it. General chat, banter, and uh, our usual uh, insouciance uh, can go in Slack. And that's this session. Goodbye. Bye everyone. <laughs>